You found it. Thank you, Andy. Uh, this is from the Living Bible. I'll put this together today. <clears throat> Fiddle with it a little bit and get the fit. Betsy, did you find your movie back there? Thank you so much. All right, I want a book report on that next week. Fifth Avenue Baptist Church, he went into, entered into a ministry called Bibles for the World, and then started his own, the Edwin Hodges Ministry. Uh, I think uh, some of you have become aware of it. He was the guy who would take uh, used Sunday school literature, Christian literature of every kind, and ship it around the world. Uh, he uh, transferred ownership of that ministry. It's called something else now, and I think it still continues. But he passed away this year, and uh, after a a wonderful ministry. He said something once that uh, has always stuck with me. Uh, where, wherever I pastored, I, I, uh, he started out by, he would put together, sorry to go here and grab a box. Uh, he would put together boxes much like that with Christian literature in it. Sunday school books and what we used to call church training books. And uh, then he would load up, he, he had a van that the Lord gave him and uh, he would load up a van, just load it up. And he would go to churches and, and unload those. And it seems like to me, if I remember right, it started out for about $5. I didn't mention that this morning, but, but our church also pays the postage on all these boxes. There's probably some of our people that don't realize that, so I need to be sure that they know there's a lot of hard work and a great expense. Every penny is worth it, though, but I, I want them to get the whole big picture, and there's still a lot more to that. But anyway... I think it wound up being about $10.50. I don't know why that 50 cents sticks with me. You could mail that package, and uh, believe it or not, people around the world are just starving to death. Uh, we, we have Christian literature and every different kinds of uh, reading, all kinds of reading material lying about the house, perhaps, and uh, so many people in the world didn't have anything. It, especially, well, when he started with Bibles for the World, uh, a lot of things were happening in the former Soviet Union. It was crumbling. And, and, and that means that there were some holes and gaps in the Iron Curtain. I wonder if my children even know what the Iron Curtain is, was. The Iron Curtain. Remember that? Yeah. You I should. can tell you who gave it the name. Was it Khrushchev or? Churchill. 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 Winston Churchill in a speech. I used to associate with Khrushchev. It seemed like he was the most ironish. All of them that shoe banging at the UN. Well, uh, so, some some holes were developing in the Iron Curtain, which was just an imaginary military political curtain, anyway. And, and uh, someone, uh, a man named Rachunga Padagi, an Indian Christian, had found that they could ship Bibles into Russia. So that's where the Hodges began that. And he, this, this is the quote he said, and it's always stuck with me. And, and uh, I believe that it's very true. He said, you know, we here as, as Christians, we're intent on reaching the world for Christ and sharing our faith and seeing the church grow and, and uh, seeing adv the advances of our Lord's kingdom. And he says, but uh, we're like farmers who are sitting at the, standing at the edge of the field and we're wondering why we don't have a great harvest when we never planted anything. We're standing at the edge of a great field wondering why our crops are not growing and we're not seeing produce and fruit because we never have planted anything. And so, you know, when we were back in Romans chapter 10, Paul said this. He said, faith cometh by hearing, but what does hearing come by? The Word of God. By the Word of God. And uh, even Jesus there in Matthew 13, when he was telling the uh, apostles, that 
his kingdom would be spread like a farmer broadcasting seed. I, I mentioned, I, I do love uh, gardening. I, I'm, I've never very been, been very good at it, but it's, it's always, it always feels like I'm helping, that God is letting me help him with something. It's like a child. And he says, come, come on and help me in the garden. Now, when we were growing up, my mom and daddy wanted to have it. Don't, I don't think daddy wanted the garden. No. Mama wanted some fresh vegetables, so we had a, a, a place that they blocked off at the end of our property. And we didn't live out in the country. We kind of lived in suburbia. But we had a, a, a garden that was probably about as big as this side of the pews. And, and mother raised all kinds of things there. And, and we had to go out there and work in it. And I, I confess, I never liked it. But, but I used to love going out there and eating tomatoes. I'm sure Danny let, I ate a lot of tomatoes out of that garden. But I'd go, I'd put a salt shaker in my pocket, and I'd go out there, and, and, uh, and I'd just pick me a, a red tomato right off the vine and just eat it right there standing in the garden. And so I didn't like it then, uh, but over the years, Terry and I have had gardens, and we've enjoyed having them. Just uh, our life is too complicated right now. We still enjoy fresh vegetables, and some of you have been very kind to share things with us. We have pastored in places before where they just really loved us down. I mean, they just, just filled our house with, with all kinds of vegetables, and it's because they, they had so much and grew so much. There's only a few of us here, but that we appreciate it all and what you shared. And, and we were always happy to, to give. Uh, her, her dad is about getting to where he can't garden anymore, but he used to, we used to be enough corn for everybody in the neighborhood and everybody in his family to have corn if they wanted. But uh, I really, I really am fond of this idea of us maybe having a little box garden out here by the, back behind the church uh, for us and then for the neighborhood too. But, you know, though many of the health, wealth, and wisdom preachers would deny this. There's no place in the Bible that says everything you do is going to prosper. Now, there's one promise that God made. Remember in Joshua chapter 1, God told Joshua, I'm going to cause everything that you do to prosper. But I, I really didn't believe that that was just a promise for Joshua. Because everything, most everything he did uh, went well. I didn't turn out too well. Hey, I, some people pronounce that this looks like an I to me. That everything you do is going to be fine. Everything is going to be okay. Everything is going to succeed. Everything you do is going to prosper. But do you know, and, and again, I go back to the our Gideon friends. This is one of their marching verses. In the book of Isaiah, it says, My word, which goes out from me, will never return unto me void. But it will always accomplish that to which I send it. And I guess I have to keep learning this lesson over and over again. So, uh, if we really, if it's, if it's important, uh, there's a lot of things you and I could do as a church to do what we think that we're supposed to be doing here as a church and as Christians to, for our lives to proceed, for Jesus to love our, to be happy with us. Uh, he loves us always, but you know, we don't always please Him, but Father. But all, all of my Christian life, I've heard stories of people just simply hearing a verse of Scripture or reading the Word of God in a hotel room and coming to know Christ, having their life changed, becoming new creatures. I have never had that profound effect on another person's life, even on my children. I, there, I can't think of anybody. We, went, we met a lot of old friends last, I saw a lot of old friends uh, last Sunday. I can't think of a single person in my life that I've been able to influence so profoundly that they, that I can say that I restructured their life or changed their life or remade them. I, I became the most important thing in their course of their life. I, I, there's not a soul. I've worked very hard. I want God to use me. I want, to, I want as Paul says, be ye therefore followers of me as I am follower of Christ. Very audacious thing to say. 
I, I just wonder sometimes if we're not supposed to throw the Word of God like it was seed out of a bag. Just throw it out there. And yes, we might be able to read it to someone or share it with someone or explain it to someone or sing it to someone, preach it to someone, pray it over someone. But the, the Word of God itself, God promises, it's always, if you just put it out there, it'll do all, it'll always do what I send it to do. And, and when it comes back, and it's kind of like it's something went out there on a, on a mission, it had an assignment when it comes back, so the Word of God is always going to say, I got it done. I, I, I completed the mission. It's done. I, it's exactly what you wanted. For that reason, if, if we don't like have a great visitation program or knock on every door, if we don't prayer walk our whole community, there's a lot of things we could or could not do. But one of the things, I think at the end of, of our ministry here or in later years, if we have to say, we did not give everybody in our community a copy of the Word of God, then, then I think somehow we didn't get it, you know. So I've, I've always known this. It's like planting seed. And then, yes, uh, as I said, I think we're supposed to preach it and sing it and share it and tell it and teach it. But the Word of God doesn't need me and you. That's why Jesus said it's just like a sower. He just went out there and he just threw it out there and seed came up. He, says he called it, in Matthew 13, he called it good seed. He said, and the disciples said, we don't really understand this parable. He says, the good seed is the Word of God. And so, one of the things that every church should probably do is say, this is our area. <laughs> This is our field. This is, this is our territory. We need to give everybody there a copy of God's Word. They might never read it. But they might. And if they ever read it, it's always going to accomplish what God sent it to do. Well, let's look at this. It's, this is in the Living Bible, Romans 12. And so, dear brothers, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living sacrifice, holy, the kind He can accept. When you think of what He has done for you, is this too much to ask? Like that, you know, King James Version says, which is your reasonable service? He says, is that too much to ask? No. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness <laughs> in all you do and think. Joe Haney was the minister of music at Willie Springs when I was there. He has passed that job along, and he's now, I think, the treasurer. His, grand, his uh, grandfather-in-law was the treasurer when I left. And I preached a sermon one day on newness. Newness. He came up to me after the service and he says, I really liked your sermon, but who's Eunice? Who's Eunice? Maybe I had a cold that day, I don't know. Then you will learn from your own experience how his ways were really, really satisfied. I think that's a lot of times why we disobey God or why we do things wrong way because we think, well, I don't want to do that. It wouldn't make me happy. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to do it that way. It, I, it doesn't sound like that was, that doesn't sound very happy. He says, you'll be satisfied if you, well, I did things God's way. As God's messenger, I give each of you God's warning. Be honest in your estimate of yourselves, measuring your value by how much faith God has given you. Just as there are many parts to your bodies, so it is with Christ's body. We're all parts of it, and it takes every one of us to make it complete. For we each have different work to do, so we belong to each other, and each needs all the others. Part of my sermon last Sunday was this article that I found in the Federalist 
online version of the Federalist. It said, two-thirds of Christians in the United States, two-thirds of them, two-thirds of the Christians in the United States say that they don't need the church. They don't want the church. They don't have any, any use for the church. And they're Christians, but they don't have any, they see that, that the church is completely irrelevant. And he talks about, he, he really goes to great lengths to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but he talks about being a Christian is like being a, a member a member of Christ's body. Now, the problem is, is that in, in the, I would say beginning in the early to mid 20th century, you know, when, when missionary efforts really began in the late 1800s and moved over in the 20th century, do you know what Organization, what they call organizations that of Christians that launched missionaries out. You know what they call them? Does that, does that ring a bell? It's from your old days of studying Lottie Moon or the, the International Mission Board, Foreign Mission Board. Pardon? No, they, they call them mission societies. Yeah, mission societies. And and uh, it says it's a social thing. It's people but it has to do with mission. But then, later on, if you were going to join something or become a part of it or associate yourself with a group, all of those people around, I guess, in the before the mid-century, mid the 20th century, they began calling those people members. And so you can be, a, you're a member uh, of uh, an organization. You were a member. It meant that your name was on a registry and, and that you were on a list and you were officially included in who they were, who they are. You're a member. Well, we begin to think of a member as a name on a list when it has always meant like a finger, a head, legs and feet. The members of your body. Now, every time it's used in the Bible, it's not talking about your part of the church and your part of the church and your part of the church because we are all on the same list, but because it's like a body and we're toes and fingers and a nose and ears and eyes. We're members. And so this is, we've, in, a, in a way, we've kind of lost the understanding. You see, I think those two-thirds of American Christians feel like I don't, I don't feel that I have to socially or in a sense of fellowship or friendship or coordinating. I don't, I don't have to be associated with any particular group of people in order to be a Christian. But they're not thinking of a person who only has five fingers or a person who only has one leg, or someone who doesn't have any eyes, or someone that doesn't have an ear, because I feel like sometimes when churches are weak, or they're crippled, or incapable of being strong, it's because they're not whole. No, you're not just a person who feels no necessity of congregating, you're a big toe. I heard a person who had uh, some problem with diabetes, he had to have both of his big toes removed. You know what he had to do? He had to completely learn how to walk. He, you know, your big toe is what you walk on. Stabilize. It it's what, you, yeah. Yeah, it's what you lean on. You don't have that big toe, you don't fall down. Okay, I gotta get this, this jumps in. All I keep seeing is this guy with a big bushy mustache and a cigar. Groucho Marx said, I would never belong to a, I would never be a member of any organization that would have me as a member. 
He said, I would never, I would never belong to an organization that would have me as a member. Oh, I got that out of the system. It doesn't have anything to do with it. But he was talking about membership. I don't know how you change anybody's mind about that. Really don't. Really don't. Because I feel like many Christians in the United States have never ever been more than a name on a list. But they kept coming. It was just because it was traditional. It was a habit. It was customary. It was part of our culture. But it's no longer a custom. It's no longer a habit. It's no longer a part of Christian culture. We have a whole generation of Christians today who they think very fondly of the statement, the Lord is my shepherd. They don't care anything at all about the flock. Do you know that there's no shepherd without the flock? Shepherds and flocks, I mean, it is. Shepherds and flocks. If you saw one guy out there on the side of the road and he had one sheep, who, well, who's that? That's a shepherd. And no, I don't think so. I think that's a guy taking that sheep for a walk. I don't know. Now we kind of romanticize it. Do you know what you call a group of wolves? What do you call a group of wolves? A pack. A pack. A pack. You're thinking lions. Yeah, lions are a pride. Yeah, you're right. I remember back in the old uh, episode of Laverne and Shirney, L L Lenny and Squeaky were going to get some really cool leather jackets, and Lenny got one, and he was going to have it uh, put on his back. Lone Wolf. Lone Wolf. We've kind of romanticized. There's actually, that's a thing. Lone Wolf. Kind of, it's almost like in the animal kingdom, the Lone Ranger. Lone Wolf. You ask, uh, you ask a ranger sometimes what he thinks of the Lone Ranger. He goes, they're always causing trouble. They don't take orders from anybody. They're a rogue. They're, if it weren't for Tonto, he'd be completely off the reservation. No pun intended. Lone Wolf. Lenny, uh, Laverne actually took the L off of his jacket. So he became one wolf. One wolf. He tried to get in with that, but it just never caught on. Because you know, that's really what a lone wolf is. He's just, just one wolf. You know what you call a sheep or a ewe or a lamb that's out there all by itself? You know what they call that? Lunch. <laughs> Dinner. Dinner. It's, it's prey. They call it prey. And that, you know, uh, have you ever heard, uh, let me see. There's four of us here. I'm going to throw this out. This is a really test. We all heard a sermon one time about a particular kind of animal that kind of goes out rogue all by itself. You remember a sermon like that? Buffalo. Who preached it? Yeah, I wanted to get Phil to come here and preach the sermon on that on that rogue buffalo. I said, bring that buffalo head. He said, man, you'll never know what all I had to go through to borrow that, that buffalo head. He said, I don't have that buffalo head. He had to move heaven. He had a, a big old real buffalo head as big as this chair, wasn't it? You remember that? That's one of the greatest sermons about church membership I've ever heard. It doesn't matter how mean and how tough. Man, you just think of a buffalo. You know what a buffalo says when he drops his child off, his little boy off at school? Bye, son. You got that, didn't you, Bessie? Oh my gosh. Big old buffalo. Well, I like that. Man, have you ever seen Dancing with Wolves? Man, buffalo. I like it when he's trying to tell them. I know where lots of buffalo are. You know, trying to, and then a teepee. It's the funniest story in all of the Western oh movies. He put that hump and those Indians must look at him like a crazy white man. Buffalo. A tongue. He said, it doesn't matter how mean and ugly and nasty and strong that buffalo is. If he decides he's not going to go with the herd, he goes, I'm just going to go out here and just 
just going to be me and Jesus out here. And he says, he will not last till the sun goes down. Wolves and coyotes will pull him down. It may take a whole pack of them, but they'll do it. He's lunch. Well, let's go on. We'll finish up. Membership. It's not optional. It's, it's not take it or leave it. It's not to like it or lump it. Being a finger, being a hand, being a foot. And that just doesn't mean being on the end of my hand or being on the end of my leg. It means walking me around and taking me places and doing things, working. God has given us each an ability to do certain things well. That's why the whole idea of being the body of Christ makes sense. There are things that you can do well that I cannot do at all. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, then prophesy whenever you can. As often as your faith is strong enough to receive a message from God. If your gift is that of serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, do a job of teaching. If you're a preacher, see to it that your sermons are strong and helpful. If God has given you money, be generous in helping others with it. If God has given you administrative ability and put you in charge of the work of others, take the responsibility seriously. Those who offer comfort to the sorrowing should do so with Christian cheer. And he only mentions a few things here, but there are, there's something you can do. There's a reason you are here. God has enabled you to be or do something. There's something that you have to offer, that you have to contribute. And if you're not here, and sometimes if we look around and say, there's something missing in our church. Yes. And it's not because sometimes we get the feeling that we have to do everything. I, uh, I, I hope you got my one call today, but that was just my way of saying, look, I, I know we, we came out of Bible school and we put our heads down, put our hand to the plow and said, okay, okay. Christmas boxes. So, whew, Christmas boxes are done. So it's always going to be the preacher who says, okay, good job, great, fantastic. Halloween. <laughs> and we got a month to, to get ready for it. And, and it's going to take all of, everything we've got. And we can try to do everything that there is to be done. We can try to do everything that we think of. We can try to do everything that we think is possible. But I'd rather... I, I really think God rather is that we force to do Christmas boxes the way that we do Christmas boxes. Do, to do vacation Bible school the way we do Bible school and to do tricks and treats the way. I think if we try to have something and listen, open your ears and eyes, kind of do a little research, listen out, get, make, make some contacts, talk with other friends. There are churches all around us. You know what they have going on? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday night? Something. you got something going every day and every night. This is not new. Paul wrote to the Galatians there in Galatians chapter 5. And they may have been one of those kind of churches that were trying to do everything that they used to do or everything that they knew that others were doing, or ever, everything that they thought was good. You know what Paul said to them? Be not weary in well-doing. Be not weary. He said, you're going to get tired of even doing good things. Tired of it. Don't you get tired of doing some things? We can't do it all. But he says, God has given you a purpose. Do that. A reason. And he is saying here that sometimes when things, when we're not able to do more, it's because we got toes and fingers and legs missing. A part of the body of Christ is supposed to be working here that, that have been assigned 
to be members of the Walnut Grove Baptist Church are not pulling their weight, they're not doing their job, they're not fulfilling their responsibility. Don't just pretend that you love others. I've met Christians all of my Christian life, but they're only pretending to love others. They're only pretending to love others. They don't really love others. They, they are irritated by others. They're, they're annoyed by others. They have no patience with others. They have no compassion for others. They don't, they're not forgiving of others. They're not kind to others. They don't help others. They have no affection for others, no warmth for others. But it's very important for them, for you to think that they love. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Stand on the side of the good. Love each other with brotherly affection and take delight in honoring each other. Every time you mention the name of your brother or sister in Christ, it ought to be honoring them. Yes, there's plenty that you could say about me, or Randy, or Ronnie, or Ned, or Linda, or Henry. There's plenty that anybody could say about us that's dishonorable. All they got to do. I, I just, I'm just so glad that I'm not president of the United States. I don't want people listening to all my telephone calls, watching me when I go to the bathroom. Speak well of each other. I heard somebody who wrote this week and says, if you can't say something good about somebody, just write it on Facebook. Love each other with brotherly affection. Honor each other. Never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. Don't be lazy. I'm finding as he used to just make daddy so mad. Daddy, even as his his physical being began to unravel in his mid-sixties. He would have like 80 and 85 year old friends of his come by and say, oh, I, I jog 10 miles a day. Ain't nothing wrong with me. I, I can do whatever I want to. Just make daddy so mad. It's like daddy wasn't doing it right or something. Well, I've got all of daddy's genetic makeup and all of his material. And yes, I'm only 63 years of age, but my daddy was John May. <laughs> and my mother was Elizabeth May. And I got them all out of a load. I got a truck load of all that. And it doesn't matter how young I am. I'm like a ticking time bomb. That has more to do, and I can just have just as, try to have as much mental enthusiasm as possible. I can almost always say I'd rather be taking a nap <laughs> about anything, but I don't nap all the time. I don't want to be lazy. I want to get things done. I want to do things. I want to tackle things. I don't want to charge things. Be glad for all that God's planning for you. <laughs> be patient in trouble and prayerful always. When God's children are in need, you be the one to help them out. And get in the habit of inviting guests home for dinner or if they need lodging for the night. We'll back up all the way up there. If someone mistreats you because you're a Christian, don't curse him, but pray that God will bless him. When others are happy, be happy with them. If they're sad, share their sorrow. Work happily together. Don't try to act big. Don't try to get into the good graces of important people, but enjoy the company of ordinary folks. And don't think you know it all. Verse 17 says, Never pay back evil for evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honest, clear through. 
Don't quarrel with anyone, but be at peace with everyone just as much as possible. Dear friends, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God. For He has said that He will repay those who deserve it. Don't take the law into your own hands. Instead, feed your enemy if he's hungry. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And you'll be heaping coals of fire on his head. There's a lot of interpretations of that. In other words, he will feel ashamed of himself for what he has done to you. Don't let evil get the upper hand, but conquer evil by doing good. Now, a speech like this is, is really just superfluous. That means it's completely unnecessary. If Jesus Christ lives inside of you and you're full of Him and full of His Spirit, you know, I can tell you that I have never killed anybody. But I wouldn't tell you it's because of the Ten Commandments that I haven't killed anybody because God has commanded me not. That's not why I haven't killed anybody. I don't love you because God told me to. I'm not willing to forgive you because Christ has insisted upon it. You and I shouldn't be kind and patient, forgiving and prayerful because it's orders. But these things ought to resonate with us and say, you know what, those are things I want to do. Those are things that are a part of me. And I think that there might be some people who read this and say, hey, you know what, I don't think, think I'm a Christian. I, I have to work very hard. I don't care anything at all about being that kind of person. It's like a litmus test. All of the good things that come out of your life, if you're a Christian, is because... Jesus is inside of you and He's generating that. He's, he's producing that. It flows from Him so naturally. It's not hard to be a Christian because Paul says He's being a Christian inside of you and it leaks out. It just pours through every pore of your body. I don't have to scrunch up my fist and grit my teeth in order to be or to act like a Christian, to do these, these Paul is saying these things, and the, the, the readers ought to be saying, let this, uh... remember when Jesus said, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, I think he was saying, if you're having to work really hard at being a good person, you're doing it wrong. It's not hard. Come to me, he says. All you that labor in their heavy labor, because that's what the Jews were doing. Man, they were they were counting beans and they were touching stones and they had scriptures on their head. And then they were observing holidays. And it was hard to be a good Jewish person. Jesus said, I'm calling you to quit all that. Come and be a Christian. Where it just, Jesus said, it flows from you like a river. It flows from you like a fountain. He says it springs up out of you. Remember what God kept promising over in the Old Testament through the prophets? He says you've been studying hard and you've been memorizing and you've been working on it, exercising on it. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write my laws on your heart. Where you don't have to study them and learn them and memorize them and Work at it. He says, it's just going to be a part of your programming. It's going to be a, a part of who you are. You know, uh, you know you've heard the phrase, haven't you? It's, a, it's actually a very technical term. Fighting fire with fire. Fighting fire, the fire. I, I had no idea. It always seemed to me uh, when I was when I didn't understand. No one had taught me or told me. I, I, I had never. I didn't know a fireman. Most trained firemen, though, they can tell you what it means because they've used this method of fighting fire with fire. 
Do you know what they do a lot of times? It sounds really nonsensical, but they have a huge, dangerous fire, and it's, it's moving. But they'll get ahead of the fire, and they'll burn a, a, a strip. They'll, they'll actually do a controlled burn. And they'll burn them a, I, I don't even know how they figure it, according to how much the wind's blowing and what's happening. But, you know, it's, it's not something that's done haphazardly. But they take their men, instead of attacking the fire, they go here a, a, a little ways ahead, maybe a long ways ahead, and they pick them out of place, and they burn them off a strip. And here comes this raging fire. Now think about that. Here comes this fire, and it's just consuming everything. And all of a sudden, it gets to a place Everything's already burned up. Yeah. The grass is burnt. The, the underbrush is burnt. And guess what happens to the fire? It's quenched. It just goes out. It doesn't have any fuel. That's how you fight fire with fire. But here, that, that is never condoned in Christianity. It's never said this way, but that's what it's implied here. He says, fight evil with good. So he's what he's saying is fight fire with water. Well, we know that's a good way of fighting fire. Jesus said that's the only way I want you to fight it. Fight fire with the opposite of fire. Sometimes they cut down trees or they dig ditches. Sometimes they burn a strip. But they're always, always praying for rain. Always praying for that little rain that God will help put this fire out. When you and I are fighting darkness, we have to fight it with light. When we're fighting sadness, we have to fight it with joy. When we're fighting evil, Paul says, fight it with good. You know, you can't out evil the devil. You can't out evil him. If you get head to head with him and he says, let's do evil, it's okay. We're going to eat him. He'll beat you every time. But if you fight him with good, he doesn't have any idea of what to do. He doesn't know how to face that. He doesn't know how to fight that. Over my 42 years of pastoral ministry, I've had many, I talked to you a couple of Sundays ago about churches being filled with lost people. They almost always want to fight the preacher. Now, not everybody, but I'm not saying, sometimes the preacher's wrong, you ought to disagree with him. Sometimes he's the preacher's wrong, you ought to oppose him. Sometimes the preacher's wrong and uh, he's out of God's will and you need to confront him. But I'm talking about mean, evil people <laughs> that really just want to destroy you in your life and your ministry. I've, I've had those. And I, 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 I tried. I always smiled. I always thanked them for their words and their actions. I never returned their foul words. I never spoke about them negatively behind their back and to their face. I never argued with them. I never challenged them. I never 